California, the Comfortably Zoned Radio Network presents Flying High Over the Zone with the Zigzag Man. I am back and you are flying high with me, the Zigzag Man, over the zone from Alameda, California. And I have a guest today, an activist, an Alameda activist, Gabriel Dolphin. How are you? I'm just fine. I never thought I'd be introduced as an activist in my life, but I'm doing just great well, here in Alameda. You were introduced to me by William Rowan, who is a local attorney and um, one of those folks involved in the Renters, Alameda Renters Coalition. Ah. And um, he tells me you'd be a good person to talk to because you have a number of causes. So I do. Read. Okay. Uh, so shall I? Uh, I I can sum it up actually pretty quickly. It's um, a number of causes, but the causes all speak to um, the problem in one area, as far as I'm concerned, and it has to do with justice. And um, the way I def- I've had to redefine or reexamine all these words that get you know, thrown about these days, and I had to ask myself, what does justice mean, and what does justice look like, and what does justice sound like, and you can find issues of justice lacking in virtually every area, social, racial, economic, environmental, justice means the lack of balance, and there is a lack of balance in all of those areas. So I see myself as an activist primarily in the cause of justice or simply e- uh, evening out the playing field for all people. Ah, now, how does that apply in Alameda, and what do you think is the most unjust thing going on right now? I'm, obviously, it's the rental situation and uh, yeah. the fact that you guys were defeated in your quest to keep rents. Uh, stabilized in the city. Yeah, it was. I see, as I see it, it's more like a, a temporary uh, loss. Only it's like they say, you know, you lose a battle, but you haven't lost the war yet. And I think that's the case. I was over at the Oakland Museum today, looking at the Black Panther um, exhibit about 50 years, uh, right. the 50 year celebration. And I was looking at the Black Panther newspaper, and they have the same freaking articles on housing and lack of rentals back 50 years ago as we have today. And it's like, oh, my God, these issues about people of color, people of, quote, lower class, they have not gone away. And what struck me today was here in Alameda, you asked about Alameda, um, we have a microcosm of what's going on everywhere, not just in our state or in our nation, but literally around the world. And that is, I see this very simply as the 1%, people who've got money, got position, got power, need to defend it, doing everything they can to stabilize their position and they, because they need people to earn their money and their keep, uh, they, they have an institutionalized way of keeping people in the tilted playing field. And the, pe- the people in general, they call them 99%, generally have no leverage, no foothold, no purchase on justice. And I would say this is pretty radical. I define that one meaning to the root. Uh, but I would say here in Alameda, we have that same problem. We have, I, I call it, a seamy underbelly here in Alameda of people who have been here a long time, um, people who have a lot vested here, who care. I'm not saying they don't care and haven't earned what they've got, but they just don't want to see anything changed. And that means not something huge and radical change, but even little things, because my sense is they fear that a little, like a foot in the door, 
or the camel's foot in the tent, the nose of the tent, is going to break open their whole tent. And so what you see as a result of that, the reaction to that type of fear that they're going to lose what they have or they won't get what they need is this clamp down, this vicious money-funded clamp down on any effort made by the the common person to uplift their living situation, even in IOTA. I, and I, I, as I said, this is not just Alameda. We are a microcosm of a, a, a problem that has been exacerbated over the past 30 years, and it's breaking apart now. Um, and I think we're going to be seeing a lot more of the need or just an automatic active response to this kind of injustice at all levels and in all cities, not just Alameda. Okay. Now, um, where do you stand in the process? What are you doing to um, to organize? Obviously, there was a terrible defeat in terms of the Renner's coalition. Um, hmm. The election was bought. Things were confused. Outside interests. Yeah played a big part in the funding of uh, the material that was sent out. Oh, and yeah. Most of all, they confused the issue by putting another referendum on the ballot and confused it and threw a l- little bit of help education, vote no on this and that. And, and yeah. It was yeah. more paid for. It's always going to be that way. And of all the cities that didn't get rental control, Richmond ended up getting rent, rent control. Yeah, yeah. No well, I think rent control. it's personal. Yeah. It's something that there are two or three big landlords, OHM, yeah. um, Gallagher and Lindsay and what have you, and they've got their finger on it. They've got it all fixed. Um, this has been going on for two or three years. We've talked about I've talked about with a number of different people involved Mm -hmm. in the Renner's Coalition cause. Yeah. could start with with Jason Buckley way back. We looked at it. We said, what is going to happen when the ultimate defeat finally comes? How are you going to come back? Is there a way to make it impossible for companies that are horning our neighbors and forcing them to um, leave the community in many cases, mm-hmm. have mm-hmm. to take jobs, to pay the rent, have to bring in roommates, this, that, and the other thing. Just well, and live in warehouses, live in warehouses that are dangerous too. I mean, that's where it goes. Well, it, the denial yeah. of that, the day that that fire happened, I cited an yeah. article that was on. Um, on one of the Alameda um, Facebook experiences. I don't remember if it mm-hmm. was Alameda 9101 or if it was um, Alameda Peeps. It, it couldn't have been Peeps because I'm banned by, by Peeps. They don't like <laughs> well, they don't like to be political. <laughs> no, they don't like, oh, of course not when it comes to that. They don't like realism. But I basically cited this. This was a result, an indirect, people died as an indirect result of the housing shortage. There's no question about it. People just lambasted me. How could you say something like that? Oh. It turns out that um, that was the case and that um, it had had a tremendous ramification. But I'm looking at it from, from the standpoint of, I know you ain't going to win unless you make it absolutely impossible for the rent for the uh, the landlords to control the big renters that you know Gallagher and Lindsay that have all this rental property. If you if one can make it impossible for them to do business in Alameda in a legal way by setting up pickets information given out 24-7, make it impossible for people to do business with them. Um, There are things to do to basically cut them off from the community. You can close Mm -hmm. down their Internet. You can close down their way of communicating. You can flood them every day. And so they just can't do business in the way they're doing business. I'm not that. Uh Uh-huh. On top of yeah. that, you just basically have to get together and form some sort of escrow account 
where rents are put in to escrow, uh, out and out rent strike. You close up the courts, put the money in yeah. escrow, you do it legally, you dot all your I's, you dot all your T's, and you force the issue. You can't have mm-hmm. This can't go on. And um, it, my, I have, um, I don't know if I'm quite that radical. Old, yeah. yeah. No. Uh, quite that radical as yet because I, I for one believe that everybody has the right to make a living. But when someone makes a living on the back of someone else and prevents them from enjoying a lifestyle that, you know, offers the basics, even the basics, then that's we're the point at which you... A living. We're not talking about a living. We are talking about a, a, a greed far in excess. Yeah. Yeah. So that's the point about the 1% and the 99, and it is greed. And I would also say it's not just the real realtors here in Alameda, but their connections to international developers as well. We're talking about a global economy. We are a microcosm, and we have inreach of global international investors seeking to, I personally believe this, seeking to buy up property here, and we have that. We uh, I don't know the exact names of the property owners, but that's part of the problem as well. So it's not just no, your local it, realtors. Okay, it's no, the problem it's, of, because basically yeah. Basically, people that own most of the real estate, um, or not most of it, but an awful lot, are the churches. So it could come back to some the simplicity of taxing organized religion, property mm. taxes, taxes on their little businesses, their little schools, their little parochial schools, this, that, and the other thing, and make mm-hmm. it impossible for religion to survive without competing with the astrologists and the palm readers and mm. all the other crap that's out there. The sun now Scientology is losing their 501c3. And that mm-hmm. has to be done with religion. So, um, well, with that in mind, uh-huh. let's, get some, get, let's get some together. There's a state, there's a city in, in Alaska, I don't know the name of the city, who is actively taxing religion and is setting a precedent, and it's a matter of choice. Cities, municipalities have that ability to just simply ta- ignore the 501c3 and tax them. Mm-hmm. Well, I've uh, read a, I've read a lot about it. I'm aware of the problems and a lot of uh, the perspective people have on the churches, and I know there's a lot of issues there. I tend to take a much more practical and day-to-day approach in terms of the in- unequal playing field and the inequities experienced here in our town. I'm a local person. I cannot solve the world's problems. I can't attack the churches, but I can go uh, into the um, city hall and make an appointment with individual uh, city council members and the mayor and the police chief, and I can say, this is a very specific problem we're experiencing here in Alameda. What are we going to do about it? And I have spoken, and we're actually moving forward. What are going to do about it? Well, what they have done... City government... There is not one ally. Ms. Vello was recently elected. She is our only hope. There is not one Uh ally in city government in Alameda for the renter. They they already said it. We don't care. We cheated. Well, I don't know. I I can't take that on face value 100% all the time because I believe change is inevitable, and that means even the most hardcore, vicious person, anti-renter, can have a change of heart if new ideas and new conversations can continue to be brought to them. I have spoken with the council members and have uh, individually, and when I bring the specific cases to them, Personally, there is a breaking down and saying, oh, I didn't realize that. Now, you may say, well, see how ignorant they are and attack them on that. But the bottom line is that the conversation has to be up-leveled. And that's where I think I have a special role to play because I see myself as uh, as an activist and a progressive to progress and move things from where they stand to a different position. I don't know where that position is going to lie, but I, I don't hunker down convince myself that it's all locked into cement, I move forward and I say with hope, 
that if I address this, that there may well be change. Now, I know that I am in the minority here, and I know that nine times out of ten, things don't change. But I do know that in the past two months, I have made special forays out into our city government and found some very interesting shifts and potential change going on. The sanctuary city thing, for example. Is, is a huge shift for this town. You think about the people, well, you may have heard about it when you watched the uh, recording of the city council when council member Odie presented the sanctuary city referral. Um, this is a huge step. You would not have seen that in Alameda a year ago, but we have it now. And it's, it may not be a victory for everybody, and some renters may say, well, why don't you treat us like you would people of color who need to be protected in, you know, with Trump coming into its presidency. It's not 100%. It's not perfect, but it's a shift. It's a movement. I feel some, I absolutely, this is a personal thing here, feel something shifting. And I, I, I don't feel it just in Alameda, but I feel it throughout the world. The world is on fire. And there are so many people now who are coming together with a different approach, not just, mm, I don't, I, it's different. That's all I can say. It's, we're all in this revolution, but the difference is that we're engaging it now and not leaving it up to a certain person here and there. There seems to be a critical mass that has collected and is creating energy, that's the best way I can put it, to move and shift things in a different way. So that means you create laws. We will be changing. Um, I forget the numbers now. I'm sorry. I should be more adept at this, but... Um, the L1 has a clause in it that needs real adjusting, and there's going to be adjustment made in that. I guarantee that. We'll get back on the air and we'll be able to discuss the changes that will be made. And that's because it's untenable that you have the uh, renter's uh, arc, Alameda renter, uh, I forget the name, um, the names of these things, yeah. Um, it's just not responsive. It's not, uh, it's not trained. It, it doesn't use best practices. There's all kinds of newly up-leveled organizational techniques that need to be thrown at this city, and that will force them to a new position because it's, it's backwater here. It's backwater. And so now you, let me you ask take you, the – Who, are, who mm-hmm. are some of your allies in city government? All those some people who are – with open to change in city government who, have who are them. listening those who are listening to my conversation I Marilyn Frank uh, Malia of course uh, are we talking about absolutely listening to absolutely you would be surprised at the at the support I've been given by Frank in areas I won't mention now but would blow you away and this happened over a year why ago not, and why not mention it Please. Because because there's I, I respect the confidentiality. What are any huh? of these people doing in a progressive manner? I'd li- like to hear it. I'm looking for positive things. Tell me about something positive about Frank. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I okay, I will say, I will say this, and with the I usually I like to go to the person if I'm going to say something, and I haven't had a chance to do that, but I will say that Frank came to me and asked if he could support me when I was a a delegate for Bernie Sanders going back to Philadelphia. Okay. Okay. Now, you that's a pretty big thing. You think about the depth of something in him that allows him to step forward that way. So uh, what I'm saying is that people come with different perspectives and different baggage and this, that, and the other, but there's almost always some facet on our multifaceted personalities that allows us to identify, connect, and move forward together positively. Marilyn has tremendous compassion for this. Let me just ask you this. When the emails came out, remember when Debbie Wasserman Schultz, all those emails came out, that the the Democratic primaries were fixed. Right. I was in the audience when that came. I was in the audience in Philadelphia, in the convention center, when that came out. Okay. And this is a very tender and sensitive thing because people are so still racked out by the whole primary and general election. But I'll tell you, I sat there. And I'll tell you that the Democratic Party white no- put white noise guns over us. They turned off the lights on us. They moved in and took our seats. 
and they took our signs away. So do not talk to me about Russia fixing the general election before you address to me how our Democratic National Committee fixed the primary. And I, that puts me, I'm jumping the shark here. Fix the primaries. Now, what, I'm just, at this point in our political, I'm 71 years old. I've seen an awful mm -hmm. lot, lot of stuff over mm -hmm. a lifetime. Never have I seen anything like this. Well, either have I. I no, wept I, because I thought I, there was some vestige of democracy. One reason I would like to know at this point how what you see is a reason that things can be successful if you work within the inside of the DNC. If, if you I, feel that you should uh -huh. be anywhere on the inside at this point. Mm -hmm. and you feel well, that's, that at, okay. that's an, um, an excellent question, and everybody wonders that because most people have thrown their hands up in the air and said, oh, it's all corrupt, I quit. What I am doing is I, I'm running for California State Delegate for our Assembly District 18. I'm running, again, I'm running on the groundswell progressive slate and running up against the, um, the uh, status quo slates that are running as well. People who are in the party, have been in the party, the party has created them. They're not bad. AD 18 is actually in good shape when you look at the rest of the country. But to me, good, is, is, good can be the enemy of better and best. So the question is, you do understand why that there are no longer two parties? Oh, I understand that totally. I understand that what I'm fighting is the 1%. I'm fighting corporations. But I have to get leverage behind my fight. And in terms of, for example, going back to the renter situation, I, my hope is to, even if I'm not elected as one of the delegates, is to keep worming my way up with the various uh, people I'm working with and various coalitions of people to continue to, to fight this fight all the way up to the state level. There's no reason not to do that. But the reason I believe in doing that is I go by Bernie Sanders. I believe in 100% together. Millions of people together, acting together in concert, there is nothing, absolutely nothing we cannot accomplish. I stand by that. I may have a lot of mini losses on my battlefield, but overall I feel tremendously optimistic. It's a terrible tragedy that has brought so many people, tragedy, I consider our politics a tragedy, and the world situation a tragedy, and Standing Rock a tragedy, and Flint, and Oakland, it's all a tragedy. The world is on fire, but the people have been ignited as well. And that's why, well, it's the Democratic Party, not the Republican Party, but whatever structure has control, I'm going to infiltrate it. I'm going to infiltrate it. And I'm going to, and the reason not to be a nasty, mean, bomb-dropping person, but so that my ideas, my perspective, my new pair of glasses can be dropped in there, the seeds planted. That's why I believe things here in the city are shifting. It's because talking with these people with a little bit different slant on a typical idea creates a change in the way it's viewed. And that's the only way we're going to start pulling this aside, pulling it into a new direction. Same thing with the state level. City, county, state. It's all a matter of get, if I may, a little bit on my soapbox here, get me in there so that I can start talking to these people. I'm not saying that I'm the sole answer, but without this new perspective, it's not going to change. It's, it's good, yeah, we're pretty lucky as Californians go, as Americans go, but it still is not good enough, and it's going to require a true progressive voice. I'll say this, and then I'll, I'll be quiet for you. Um, the, oh, you sound, you sound wonderful. I love your enthusiasm and your way oh, over. Well, I'm telling you, there's every, every reason to be enthused, and there are so many ways that without, with minimal energy output, you can place your body in a place where you will be seen as saying no, no to fracking, no to uh, – racism, no to classism. All you have to do is take a stand. And so the bottom line is about this, um, this election, there, there is no question that the, uh, the other slate that is running uh, are good, but that without that input, without a change, actually, I forgot what I was going to say. Sorry. <laughs> 
the bottom line is, you, you know, I, I'm optimistic and I'm going to do it. You grew up in Minneapolis, am I not correct? I, I did, yes. And we yeah. brought you out here because that's a very progressive state on a lot of levels. Well, it was. Um, well, actually, I was born in Minneapolis, and I was raised in Arizona, Tempe, Arizona, and I went to school in um, Claremont, California, and did a lot of traveling and studying overseas, ended up getting a master's in anthropology in Tucson, and then moved out here and um, have been living out here for, gosh, close to 36 years now. That still makes me a youngster in Alameda, I know, but, you know, 36 years, there's nothing to spit at. (laughs) Pardon? Uh, I spoke over you, but I want to know who your political role model was, who who influenced you initially in politics. I, I was never involved in politics until I heard Bernie Sanders talking over my computer at work about 18 months ago. Just 18 months ago. And he so shocked me. I was so convinced I would never hear that integrity and those ideas. So convinced I would always have to hide for fear I would be criticized for my progressive leanings that I didn't get involved politically. But then when he said, we can do this, I jumped on board and I just can't stop because he gave, he gave word to my feeling. He gave voice to hope. And I'm, I, just what I've seen in the campaigns for all the hell we've gone through and the cheating and the lying and the stealing, everything being brought up and put in the light, it'll never go back down again now. We're, we're too intensely involved in the destruction. Um, I, I'm here to, for the rest of my life, whatever years I have remaining, and I'm not a spring chicken anymore, I will dedicate it to that because politics means how we live socially, how we live out there on the street. It's, it's not a complicated thing. It's complicated with money and special interests, but the fundamental is how do I want to be treated out there on the streets? And it goes back to, if I may bring it back to this fundamental golden rule idea, do to others as you would want them done to you or don't do to others what you don't want done to them. And this is called justice. It's, and justice, as uh, I forget the name of the guy, but he says justice, rather love, looks like justice out on the street i just can't fall away from those definitions that is so true i can live my life i can walk each step each day based on that idea alone nice nice yeah uh, you've enthused me you put a face <laughs> to activism and well. humanity to it which um most times it's a bunch of people with signs screaming this that and the other thing now, no. I yeah. want to talk practicality. Do you have some yeah. for, um, that, that are going to make an instantaneous change locally? Is there anything um, you can put your I think on? quite on. Uh, well, uh, it, changes don't come with a blink of an eye. They take it's pro- Change is not an acute event. It's a process. And um, except like birth and death, that's kind of instantaneous change, but everything else is a process. And, uh, for example, to go back to this idea of you you work in a way that brings the greatest impact for the issues you're concerned about. The, the, let, I'll just briefly say one of the most, in fact, it is the most fundamental problem to fix in our politics, in the world politics, is huge corporations, big money dictating how the world works. Okay. We have our state Democratic Party chair election coming up. Now, the question is, when you put, or the situation is, when you put someone in a state party chair like that, they have influence nationwide, and they can actually dictate how other party, our our party can, because they're so big and powerful, can pretty much dictate how they would like to see other people, other parties move the Democratic parties. We have, for just recently, there was a ban placed on fossil fuel money going into the California Democratic Party. This is critical because that's a huge, huge chunk of money going in influencing our local politics. Look at all the freaking fracking that's been going on in the state. We had to stop it in Alameda County, and it was stopped just two months ago, two, three months ago. 
bottom line is there are two people running for chair of the Democratic Party in California. One, Kimberly Ellis, has said that she will maintain that ban on fossil fuel in the party and she will expand it to tobacco, big tobacco. The other character that's running against her has made no promise to continue this ban on fossil fuel. Okay. That means I need to be a delegate in the party so I can promote Kimberly Ellis. Well, in the meantime, what I've done is I have booked Kimberly Ellis to speak to the City of Alameda Democratic Club, first meeting we have in January. That's, to me, instantaneous That's change. Fun. All right. Let's, let's, yeah. let's, make that, um, let's make that something that the show can follow. And yeah. We make an event out of that where, that I, I can help support that in any way I can. That would be wonderful. Yes. Do you see anything – I'm just curious because since those emails came out and Uh since um, I was able to, in my own mind, put Barack Obama's career as the president of the United States into perspective, okay? Uh Uh-huh. He's had a war going on the entire time. Yeah. He racks, he waterboards, he wiretaps. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. He sold out the Jews. <laughs> he deports. He and deports. Now, here's this, one, here's this one thing. He made a deal with Monsanto that was so basically evil and intrinsically horrible. Let's just put mm-hmm. it the only way I can say it with Monsanto that basically sold humanity out. Mm. Pure mm-hmm. and simple. Obamacare mm-hmm. should be his legacy. In mm-hmm. actuality, it's Romney care. Romney made the whole yeah. job. Yeah. Um, so that, what is it that you're hanging your hat on that you could go to a Democratic and you could say... You know, with a straight face, said, this is what they did. This guy got elected not because of anything good about Donald J. Trump. He got elected because he identified Hillary Clinton. He identified oh. the fact that, um, and again, the, the Bernie thing. I'm a big Bernie guy from way back. Mm-hmm. I don't like mm-hmm. everything did. I didn't like the gun control. didn't like his softening on the Israeli th- thing when mm-hmm. he was talking to a New York delegation mm-hmm. in the primary. He ended up looking stupid. He made, he let her go, he let Hillary go on as if her administration was supporting Israel. And mm-hmm. he sat there like a schmuck. And he lost. Mm-hmm. Now, mm-hmm. he lost because they didn't count his votes because they screwed him, and that was, was obvious. When they did that, how could you? I, I, I'm just. It, it, it sounds Pollyannish almost to accept the fact that this is a party that's any different than the other party. That oh yeah. Um, in my just briefly to kind of summarize, it, it takes yeah. a lot of self discipline to get up mm-hmm. in the morning and say. I'm going to be talking to these people as if they're any different than a Trumpite. Um, well, because I, I have a vision that every human being has a spark of the divine in them. And I do not believe that that spark can ever, ever be snuffed out. And that is what I speak to. I do not speak to the moniker they wear or the hat or the position they take on. I look at them square in the eyes, beyond the eye, into the spirit that animates that physical form, and I see that spark of, for whatever you want to call it, that creates, that not creates, but makes things move and happen. I speak to that. I don't have to solve the world's problems now. I don't have to punish my government. I don't have to rip Hillary a new whatever, or punish Bernie because he caved. The world is what it is. The question is, how am I going to and what 
am I going to bring to this world? I can't fight that crap, but what I can do is see directly into that creature, however it's been formed and, and forged through his, its experience, his, her experience. I can reach into that common denominator, which is the heart. That golden spark is the heart. I've traveled all over this world, and I do not believe I need to know a language. We all speak the language of the heart, and that's what I get up to. I I don't play the political game. I can speak the language of the heart when it comes to justice because that's what it's all about. If we all have this heart, this longing to, to live and to love and to laugh and to experience all the things that life offers us, we all have that as human beings then that's what I fight for. And I'm not going to stand by and not call out people who start to pull in and squirrel away their little store of special nuts, their money, all that stuff, because they're greedy. I'll call them on and say, well, what about the person over here? And the answer you're going to get is, well, they should be working harder. I'd say, stop. You, know, you have to have a whole domino effect conversation with this, and it may not be one, but at least you address it from I address it from the core of my truth to the core of that creature. And that creature, that's a human being I'm talking about there, that creature may never in this lifetime be able to comprehend justice. And I accept that. Okay. Now, your, um, your basic thing is that corporate greed has an awful lot to do with it. I think organized religion, and I think that if you combine those two Mm -hmm. with government, you have what I consider to be the unholy trinity of all time. Mm -hmm. Well, I wouldn't argue with you. I think any time you get people in a position to be able to get money, accumulate money and capital and wealth, you're going to find power issues because they have to maintain that. Church, of course, we see all... Oh, my goodness, these big pictures of that crystal cathedral and all the talk about the Catholic Church's holdings and... Yeah, I agree. Anywhere you have power, you will have an accumulation of wealth, and that power is to defend the wealth. So I just happen to pick corporations because I personally think that money has become our – money is God now. And so whatever the churches may be telling you – Let's tax religion. Let's tax religion. Yeah, right. We'll work together. You work on the corporations. I'll work on taxing religion. How about that? I think that would be great. I do think that the churches ought to be taxed because I think there are all kinds of loopholes, but that's a whole. Yes. Let's start here in Alameda. Let's get a key. I I only do work locally. (laughs) So, yeah, sure, start here. Here Not all churches necessarily need to be taxed. Let's start with this. Let's start with why don't you and I make them earn their tax deduction. It's very difficult to, for them, for us to all of a sudden look ahead, we're going to tax the church. But uh-huh. instead of that, why don't we hold them up to their commitment? And how about... How would you... How do you see... Uh-huh. What's going on now? We have a cold snap going on. So uh-huh. Described it as a cold snatch. I don't think they were... They were quite right about that the other day. <laughs> but um, it, you never know. And so the, the demise of journalism. The weather was very frigid, and so was the cold snatch, too. But <laughs> that um, notwithstanding brings to mind that during the cold, there are an awful lot of folks who are displaced, many of them children, mm-hmm. many of them living mm-hmm. in vehicles, many of them living in cardboard boxes, this, that, mm-hmm. and the other thing. So let's get together and say that the the churches, synagogues, and mosques in Alameda, Mm -hmm. let's just say the city of us start there and start with the big mama. (laughs) Start start with St. Joe's and all their craziness, okay? Mm -hmm. And let's just say that in order for them to get a tax deduction and not pay property taxes and not pay pay taxes on their business, that all they have to do on a rotating basis is every night of the week open their doors, their basements, their pews, set up cots to the homeless. 
Well, there'd be liability issues, etc. But one I, church. I, pardon me. Uh huh. I, I, I mean, it, my first thought would be there'd be liability issues, etc. But my thought is, oh, are you willing? Issue. Oh, my God. Are, no, 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 no. That, that's just a, insurance to help. That's just a quick thought. My thought is, if you were to call and to organize a panel, a forum of all major church uh, leaders here in the community and ask them about this. You see, this is my very point. We've got our community just chugging along in its same old way, and no one has pulled them together and asked the new question. They've given us their answers. We have to... Wait, uh, maybe I haven't heard them. We can't call a panel. We have to storm the doors. You can't say, oh, can we get together and maybe form a college and then everybody get together? No, 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 no. The well, door, open well, the doors. Not no, I, well, that's where maybe, uh, maybe you think I'm not one of those, uh, what do you say, I don't yield, wield a pitchfork and a torch in my activism. I believe, in, as I was saying, reaching out to the human being yes, and saying, let's, humanity, let's build, a co- build a coalition of conversation. Because everyone feels shut out and threatened and don't want to converse. We have to build bridges, not walls. And when I come at someone in any way aggressively, they're going to instantly throw up their defense. So I don't want to do that. So I I will approach them and say, I have some concern about, I'd love to see you guys helping more with our homeless problem here. Can we get together and start coming up with some solutions? I think they'd be willing to step in on that. Oh, yeah. Aren't they? <laughs> Why? I, I at least I would try it. Okay. Um. What are you gonna call? You gonna call them and say open up, open up the gates? If no, I don't. I gonna say come and tell me what. Two degrees on their own, and they don't, and they are quote religious and they're getting well, tax deduction and they don't come to the community I should they probably don't. let you know I should probably let you know that I have a doctor of ministry and so I come from a long tradition of studying many many cultural and spiritual traditions and I know many of not I don't know all but I know many of the church leaders small church leaders here in town that are the most uh, accommodating, loving, open-hearted, open-armed people that I've ever met. Uh, I, I think these people, that, they're that in community. If you and I make phone calls this week, we would expect to have a rotating um, system where people come in off the street on a nightly no. basis. Maybe three Are you, of them a, a night, three churches a you, night, and a synagogue. Well, Right. So well, what, what you're saying is, no, you're you're casting it in a way that I'm not saying. You're saying make a few call, phone calls, boom, it's going to happen. I'm saying no, it comes in phases. You get, you have to oh, talk so you have to, to people. Conv- in other words, they wouldn't be convinced by making a few phone calls that this is is an automatic. It's 32 degrees. You got kids living out there. You got people in in cardboard boxes. In other words, we'd have to start a negotiation. They wouldn't. Well, it, this but, week, when it's cold, they're going to No, I it. see. I, I understand your moral point, but I'm just not going to not going to take the bait here because I would do this differently than the way you would like to see it done. That's all I can say. Okay, how would you do it? I'm telling you, I would I would set up some meetings down the road, maybe one, two, three. It's a good magic number, and say at the end of these meetings, let's have some consensus and let's see who's going to be opening their door, their door on what date. I'm not going to expect to pick up a phone and say, "Hey, you, open your door." I just don't see it that uh, way. But would you expect them to call the community if, in a perfect world, and say, "Where we'd like to open the door"? Can you help us get the word out that we're going to be taking people in because it's cold as fuck? <laughs> I mean, if, would, I, am I right? You see what I'm saying? Would you expect them to be calling the community? And if you have to call them because they're not calling 
the community. Oh, I see what you're saying. Well, I, I'm not going to stand here. I'm not going to stand here and point fingers at a behavior that I, of course, couldn't condone. Of course, if someone were out there freezing cold, I'd bring them in. But I'm not going to, as they say, point fingers at a glass house. So I'm going to I'm going to approach it in the most humane way possible and civil. If you're not going to point fingers, and you're the activist. Who can we get to point fingers? Yeah, well, see, you're looking at me as an activist who has the pitchfork, the torch, and is pointing fingers and yelling and screaming, you're to blame. I'm not a blamer. They can go to people and say, look, people are hurting. That's precisely what I would do, but you're not hearing how I'm going to do it. Set up the meetings. Well, you know, I wish, but I am so engaged in about ten different progressive issues here in this town. I can't possibly take this one on right now. Any more important than the homeless in this town? Oh, oh my God! Right now? <laughs> You're guilting me, sweetie. You're guilting me. I, I'm good at it, aren't I? I'm Jewish. <laughs> You're really good at it. <laughs> I, uh, there, are, there. Are, has, pardon me. There is a lot of issues, I'm and, you know, I've just committed. I'm looking for an activist. I'm looking for an ally on this. I'm looking well, for somebody I, who can make we'll, people I'll, feel like shit because it wasn't their idea, and they have Jesus' teachings. What uh-huh. would Jesus do? Oh, well, I know. Jesus, well, I, I was saying, what would Bernie would do? Wealth? Would <laughs> Jesus sell some of the wealth? Would Jesus voluntarily share the money brought in? His his teachings were his teachings, and the time he lived in was not the time we live in now, and we've got oh, our I set know. of very unique I problems. So, um, so let's go get them. Let's make them feel like... <laughs> they, they let's do turn over that do table at the temple. <laughs> well, I'll tell you what. Um, it's a start. So... <laughs> I, the way I look at it, I got the yellow pages here. I got about close to a hundred of these little businesses set up all over okay. Alameda, which means that if we each made thirty calls a day, by next Friday, we could call and requ- and get the response of the people that we're going to ask. We'll ask a set question. We're, do, we're gonna set up something where there's a rotating thing and we got to do it this week because it's cold it's winter and there and we got to do it with some aggression because you know i would what? uh-huh Go ahead. i would say to be a, perhaps a little bit more uh i don't know i don't want to be called uh whatever i am an activist here's what i would do we have approximately 15 to 20 homeless people here in alameda I, I do know that our police department and our health and our wait, human... Wait, 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 wait. Uh-huh. We have how many homeless... They did a census on the homeless here in Alameda, and we have there about 20 full-time... There are 15 full-time. walking out there that are, that are homeless. Am I correct? 15, I don't remember the exact number, but I remember it was between 15 and 20 full-time, as it were, homeless... Here, our homeless in Alameda. There are others who come across the bridge, et cetera, but we have 15 to 20 full-time that sleep in parks or sleep on the shore or that. Now, what I would do if they wanted to, out because the that's the issue, out on the uh, I, I don't know if they're on the base. I actually haven't seen homeless on the base, but I, I don't go looking for them on the base. But there are other facilities nearby that we have worked very closely with in times of cold, helping to place these people. I personally have gone on census counts where I've handed out supplies and, and the things that are necessary when you're just trying to maintain a day-to-day outside and help get them put so into a shelter for the cold weather. 30. So it, that, that's the approach. Can we arrange of the in one week to get 30 people housed regularly with a rotating group of of folks who own churches and and mosques and um, do you think we could or it shouldn't be that hard to get 30 people no I think it's a great idea it's certainly worth pursuing but it would take a certain way of pursuing it in order to make it successful my goal would be don't jeopardize the success of it by the passion at the beginning of the project oh okay well let's just then we'll start 
nice and easy and nice and conservative and assume that because there are 30 people homeless, and I'm sure that all the RVs and the cars and, and all that stuff, there were hundreds, honey, hundreds. Um, there may be those who have been kicked out of their homes for the rent the situation. That, that we have documented and get them housed within a week. Let's see if you and I can do that. That's activism. I, I don't, but you keep asking the same question. I've told you that, I, I, A, I can't. I think I just can't. And, B, I would pursue it differently. I'm so sorry this is a cold season and I can't do anything right now, but I can only do so much. So you're not hearing my approach and you what keep asking you the same more question. More important than this, I, without the guilt thing, what is I don't know if it's more important, but I do know that I've got the energy and momentum in these projects, and I have to keep doing it. You're an activist, darling. What is there that you're doing in the next that I can't borrow your time to activize? <laughs> Me and you done activizing for two weeks, okay? What is it that you, I'd be interrupting that can't well, wait? Well, uh, now, of course, you're going to start and parsing my hours. I... I work full-time at Children's Hospital, okay. and that's in the neonatal intensive care unit, which is, I'll just lay that out there to let you know the depth of my involvement. I come home, and, and I'm often involved in just catching up on my normal load. But, for example, on Monday, I will have another interview with a journalist. On Tuesday, I have to write a special ad that has to get into the sun in order to advertise Kimberly Willis or Ellis so that everyone will know she's our girl for state chair. And then on Wednesday, I have an overnight, not overnight, but a night meeting with, uh, night dinner with my mother-in-law who is over at Cardinal Point. Thursday, I have to actually get this thing into... Is your mother-in-law a person of good, of good heart like yourself? Oh, extremely good heart like myself, yeah. Let's get together the three of us now. We have three people to make calls and see that every church, synagogue, and mosque is informed of the fact I can see why you were kicked off, Pete. Pardon? <laughs> I can see why you were kicked off, Pete, or put in jail, whatever any, they call that. You are you so to, persistent. Anytime you want to compliment me, I love it. <laughs> no, I, and I believe in persistence. We need that. All right. But unfortunately, well, it's an issue um, that I just can't respond to. So we got your mother-in-law going to make 30 calls, I'm going to make 30 calls, and you're going to make 30 calls. We're going to get all of the Ghanafs to get <laughs> and Well, at, see, I really do take this idea seriously. So if you don't do something, you will see some follow-up, but you're not going to see it like this week from me. I really think oh. that I'll be able to pull a coalition together to, do, to make a plan for Alameda to help the homeless. These are people on the ground is what I'm no, counting, I mean, not in the direct, No, I mean directly through the church, churches and synagogues and mosques, can we work together to try to get them to open the doors in the next couple of weeks? Give me, give me some of your time. Even if it's too why don't Why don't you gather? Why I, I, I just, I can't, I I'm not going to rationalize right my time. Why don't you gather a couple of your friends and form a car, a, a phone bank and do that? Why don't you do that? I'd love for you to do it. I can't do it all. Part of my activism is my ability you to delegate. You can't do it all, but I'm asking you to do it. This one thing, give me two weeks, and I will promise you my undying support on your projects. This has been my project. I, I, I hear you, that. You're, you're quite passionate about this. You help the world. You're a, a minister. You, you went to school to be a minister, did you? I went to school to be a minister, but I also went to school to be an anthropologist. Okay. How does anthropology set in with, um, for instance, um, evolution? Um, what do you feel about that? Just out of curiosity. About, I didn't catch that word. Feel about what? I'm just, anthropology, how does that fit in with evolution? <laughs> well, anthropology is the study, uh, there are different, different branches of anthropology. My right. study was cultural anthropology. Anthropology is a scientific study. 
Well, they try to make it scientific. I don't think it can be all that scientific. But, yes, anthropology, a cultural anthropology, you study the ways in which people interact and get things done. Uh, there's right. physical anthropology that seeks to uh, trace human origins as far back as it can go. I'm hoping they'll get actually to the Big Bang at some point. Um, there's bio anthropology. It's a kind of a biosocial anthropology that looks at the biology of the human being and cultural manifestations of the biology. Um, there's well, just I all kinds like of things. I to know how you took a leap of faith based on all of that scientific knowledge and your prenatal experiences and everything you have going for you with a whole bunch mm -hmm. of seichel. That means brains. Mm -hmm. okay. mm -hmm. How did you take a leap of faith into, um, this is just my curiosity, mm -hmm. the ministry? Uh, well, well, you know, the whole, everything, what I studied was the mystical path. And it's entirely different than a theological or human-bound divinity. Mine was the mystical path. And what I found after a whole lifetime, decades, of doing everything, of studying every tradition, I came to the conclusion that no one knows what they're doing and that it's up to me to figure it out one day at a time. Not only one day at a time, but I have this image. If you look down at your two feet there on the ground or the floor and you put a tiny little tea candle on each and light each tea candle, I can take one step forward and have my world illuminated precisely the amount it's meant to be illuminated for me to get through that day. The next step I take will illuminate precisely what I need to keep moving forward. In the end, I'm headed to oblivion, the great mystery. I, I, it's not that I'm going to eternity because we're already all in it, but uh, that's about as uh, that's what all of my studies brought me to. My leap of faith is a very practical. I need to be able to walk through this life, and everything feeds into that uh, image, and that I feel quite comfortable and very happy with that image. Okay. Um, you know that there are folks that consider people at, with spirituality as simply space cadets, so that having that in your repertoire, having that in um, in your being, you're to be commended. You have you have thoughts and you have a belief system, and you're to be commended. You put some thought into it. But it gets down to what can I believe and what do I feel is true. And when someone tries to tell me there's, they can give me something that will make make the make life not painful. I know they're trying to sell me something. I know life is what it is, and I have to come up with something that I can feel comfortable with getting through. And I do feel, by the way, there's a huge growing appreciation of the difference between religion and spirituality. I think spirituality is we're born with a spirituality. Religion is something that we're taught. So I, I think there's quite an understanding of the difference between the two. And more and more people are waking up to it. You did get into the disadvantages of worshiping a Jew who wasn't me myself. Mm. Mm hmm. <laughs> I'm just, I'm just <laughs> cheating you. Yes. Yeah, right. Um, I, I want you to help with this as a coalition with the churches to get together and, and make them aware. I, of get let's their make answers. an appointment. Let's record, just get their responses of why they can't or why they won't. And you know, doing that, I, again, I have to repeat that I can't take this project on now, but I want you to notice that when you say, and let's record, that somewhere in your spunky little spirit, you want to catch them saying something that you can rip them a new asshole over. And oh, I don't I play want, that game. I want their reaction, and I want to publish their reactions. Yes. And what, and that, we kind of intuit what you think their reaction is going to be, so then we can intuit what we think your reaction to their reaction is going to be. Well. Right? Well, and it's all good if, podcast. If we do it scientifically and simply record <laughs> their answers. Right. Then, um, then it, it comes down to just making them aware. Of their of their own words, making them earn their words, and then go after their religion. If they can't help, if they won't open the doors, 
to the homeless, do you see a reason they should have a 501c3? I'm just curious. I, as I said, I'm all for ha- taking the church, all massive churches, 501c3, tax-free, etc. at least in part. Maybe not all of the things the churches do should be taxed, but I think in part when you start to look at all this um, incredible okay, property but ownership. I think what I'm doing is extremely fair by offering them a reason to keep their 501c3 by saying yes to opening the door to the homeless. And I think what? that's so banal and fundamental to their existence mm-hmm. that it will show us a lot and it will give us an idea of which churches, synagogues, and mosques help and which don't. And so are you willing to are you willing to do something about this or are you just going to keep talking about it? I'll make, I'll make 30 calls this week. There you go. You're off and running. Right. And I'll circle, I'll circle back and check in with you on this very project. Because you're busy, because you're busy, would you be kind enough to find me someone else that you think would help me for this week? To I'll, and get? I'll put out a notice, and I'll ask if people at this point, this time in the year, I know it's cold, and that's the most important thing, but, I mean, I can only put out a feeler saying, would anyone be interested in working with X on this project, okay? Is that all you could do, or could you call the people that you work with that have been social activists and just have them call me? Well, those, yeah, those are the people I would, those are the people I talk to. So okay. would I, you have them, you know. would you put a few people in touch with me? If you're interested in getting some people moving on a project like this, yes. I would be happy to put the feeler out and see if there's someone interested. You know, what I would suggest for you, though, is to go to the Social Services and Human Relations Board and ask them to do this for you, because this falls right under their bailiwick. Issues Uh, about, you know, people who are homeless and cold this is a problem and concern they need to deal with directly. No, there is, and if there you, are if, no social, there are no, it's been demonstrated that there are no social money available for stuff like that. In no, I'm talking about the board, shrub, they call it shrub, doing the talking to the various community members, churches, and uh, talking about the possibility. Various, the various community members represent the congregation of the church, synagogue and mosques, who have been proven not to really give a crap because they're not coming to the community and saying, how can we help? The fact that activists have to go to them is very telling, is it not? Well, what's telling is this is your perspective going in, and I would also remind you that they also have their own people within their church that they're doing a lot of help and work for, too, because a lot of these churches I know, a lot of people are not wealthy, and they're having problems right now. Well, uh, they do have shelter. They can offer shelter. Can I, am I correct? I don't know. I don't, attend, I don't attend any of these churches. I talk to people in them, the ministers. What do they say when you talk to them in to the people that are in I don't the I'll be honest I haven't spoken specifically about the cold out in the streets of Alameda but when I talk to them about the people who they meet every day who are suffering and who are in a terrible position they don't know if they're going to be evicted from their home if they're going to have money for food that month they certainly can't get their medicines these ministers don't just say oh you poor dude they pitch but in. They try to get their community to participate in that person's family's life to help them out. This is what they, ministry is all about. But because there is a homeless problem, if you will, doesn't that, without defending the position, show us that what they're doing isn't enough? Just that, in other words, does it have to be analyzed any any more clearly, they're clearly not doing it, or they would You know, Ralph, I tell you what, I think we've probably gone on long enough, and I'm going to hang up so that I can tend to some other matters here, um, but I promise you I'm going to check in with you, and I'm going to ask various people if they'd be interested in working on this project with you. They okay? Are, and it's, it's just, 
It's not a real long project. We're just calling and getting their reaction. Calling. I think the people I would talk to would want more than just a reaction. They'd want real success in the project, but I'll let them deal with you on that. Well, of course, you have to start somewhere, and you have to yeah. get an idea. And educating the public as to who the churches, synagogues, and mosques are that are willing to help is in itself a service. Am I correct? Uh, it. I would have to say, I'm sure, I mean, I think people do know, actually, who might, or I don't think anyone's been asked, and why you want to advertise people's or institutions' responses other than to shame them is something I just don't get, that attitude, you know, I just don't, I think we've just suffered enough of that stuff as people. attitude of shaming them, or is it calling attention to the shame that they bring on themselves by not opening their doors without having to be asked that bothers shaming them. shaming is shaming no matter who does it to who huh. so as I said though I'm going to have to ring off here because I'm going to have to go get to something in the kitchen there so I've got it started okay I can appreciate that and I really enjoy your company and I enjoy your spirit and I just want you to know that you got a partner in activism I'm glad to have you. That's great. And I'm glad you're out there stirring this stuff up. Uh, Somebody has to do it if it weren't for you and I. We'd be in big trouble, right? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, take Uh, care. Bye. Thank you. I hope you come back soon. Adios, everybody. We'll catch you on the flip-flop. And uh, this is the Comfortably Zoned Radio Network identifying all faces of activism. The lovely and provocative Miss Dolphin was with us, and I thank her and hope she comes back. Have a wonderful day, everybody.